Time Splitters was one of, if not the best, launch title when the PlayStation 2 made its debut. It's a first person shooter with very little story and instead focuses on providing a fast and thrilling gameplay experience. Basically, some alien race called the Time Splitters can leap through time and they are trying to destroy the human race, and you're the only one standing in their way. The game is largely split up into a series of levels that depict a variety of different time periods where you have to retrieve an item and bring it back to the starting point, all the while dealing with a range of enemies that will stop at nothing to bring you down. Of course, there's a big old list of weapons that can be used in the game, from the old fashioned that were all the rage in the last couple of centuries, to the weapons of today all the way to the future, where all of your bullets turn into lasers. Each of them have ups and downs, and many have two different firing types that you'll be utilizing as you try to reach your goal. As when you manage to pick up the item you need and start to head back, the enemies begin to split time and literally appear out of nowhere, demanding that you stay on your toes throughout the duration of each mission. However, for as fun and as challenging the campaign can be, Time Splitters absolutely steals the show when it comes to multiplayer, and provides to this day one of the most enjoyable co-op experiences you can find. It contains every level you'll play through in the campaign, plus special multiplayer maps for up to four players to jump into. From here, you can take part in several types of modes that range from capturing the flag to simple death matches that really showcases the incredible gameplay and everything that Free Radical achieve. Although it's not without its faults, Time Splitters holds up incredibly well, and it's a shame that we still haven't got a modern take on this timeless classic. When it came to being an RPG fan during the 6th generation, the PlayStation 2 was the place to be. Sure, the GameCube and Xbox had plenty to offer as well, but many of the most memorable games found their home on the PS2, with the likes of Final Fantasy X and Rogue Galaxy proving that the console was more than up to the task when it came to creating captivating adventures. One game that never really got its chance to shine though was Unlimited Saga. First off, there's no main story to follow. Instead, each of the seven characters you get to choose from have their own scenario to play through. One of the characters, Myth, is looking for a mysterious woman, while another character, Armek, is out to bring Rain back to his village by collecting a number of items. This unconventional approach to the narrative blends into the gameplay as well, with the adventure being largely represented through a series of maps and menus, instead of having a traditional world to explore on foot. Here you can visit towns, equip your characters, or embark on a mission to one of the several dungeons that make up the game. This will no doubt turn some players off, but in my eyes, the battle system more than makes up for it. It's a turn-based system that sees you getting 5 attacks per round and spinning an enormous reel that either powers up your attack or allows you to use a different variation of the ability you choose. It sounds simple, but it's not, especially when you consider the different magic and weapon types and the fact that you can chain these attacks into devastating combos. Overall, Unlimited Saga is a severely underrated RPG, and the somewhat steep learning curve is the only negative I can throw at it. If you're willing to look past it though, you'll soon find yourself engrossed in an entirely new way of battling, and with its seven separate storylines, there's plenty to keep you coming back. Capcom became synonymous with the 2D fighting genre thanks to their incredible contributions with Street Fighter, Darkstalkers, and many other examples, but when it came to creating an all-new fighter based on the Sengoku Bazaar franchise, they turned development duties over to Arc System Works. Known for their beautiful sprite work and intricate fighting mechanics, Arc System did the source material justice and produced one of the best 2D fighters on the system. It offers up your standard gameplay modes that you'd expect from the genre, with arcade versus survival and challenge, all providing different ways to play the game. You've got several characters to try out, all of which share basic attacks through the free button setup in the form of weak, medium and strong, which you can use in tandem with other buttons or directions to chain together combos and special moves. Now since nearly everyone in the game is armed with some sort of weapon, attacks and their effects are dependent upon the character you choose, from status effects to different types of gauges that fill up that allow you to perform your specials, so it's a good idea to at least sample each character and see what they have to offer before settling on one to use. For more seasoned players, there are various special techniques to employ, including perfect guards, launching moves, that can knock opponents across the screen and into the air, as well as landing recoveries that round out the pretty robust mechanics in place. Sengoku Bizarre X isn't going to win any awards when it comes to trying new things, but if you're looking for a solid 2D fighter to play on the PlayStation 2, then it's definitely something you'll get your money's worth out of. With its wealth of content and intricate gameplay mechanics to learn and master, this is one game you do not want to skip. 
Ape Escape 3 is without a doubt one of the best platformers on the PS2, with the series' roots reaching all the way back to the original PlayStation in 1999 that introduced one of the strangest concepts ever seen in the game. You take control of one of several characters who is charged with stopping the evil monkey Spectre who is in possession of a helmet that grants him intelligence. To stop him, you were given a large catching net and your objective was to simply catch as many monkeys as you can. But the real catch of the game was the pioneering use of the dual analog stick control present on the DualShock controller. One stick controlled the character's movement, while the other the direction of whatever gadget you are currently using. The third entry, while being similar to what made the previous two games so great, features entirely new gameplay additions that largely make it the most enjoyable out of the lot. The main big addition is the inclusion of different forms that you can use to beat puzzles, enemies, or to help catch lots of monkeys really quickly. Each form provides new abilities, such as being faster, stronger, or having the ability to attack from and distance, as well as providing a solution to blocked off objects or hard to reach locations of monkeys. It's a great system, with plenty of personality as you take on the persona of ninjas, superheroes and knights that give the game an immense amount of personality. This translates to the levels as well, as each of them are built around some sort of theme. Most of these levels end up being very satirical in nature, and poke fun in nearly every Hollywood genre and cliché. From horror films to spaghetti westerns, there are plenty of pop culture references that'll no doubt put a stupid grin on your face. Despite all the extra mechanics layered into Ape Escape 3, it is still basically a game about catching monkeys in a net. Even so, its cotton candy visuals and general hilarity make it easy to recommend for players of all ages. Fans who have been playing Gradius since the original was released will know exactly what to expect with the fifth entry. The graphics and sound have improved and the controls have been updated for the PS2, but the gameplay is still the same as it always has been. Not that it's a bad thing by any means, as the systems in play are executed perfectly. You take on the role of a pilot and are sent on various missions to protect the world of Gradius from an invasion. You must use your vast array of weapons to penetrate the alien forces and destroy them before they destroy you. You start off with a slow ship, a standard gun and no missiles, lasers or shields, but as you progress and destroy certain enemies, they will leave behind power-ups that enable you to activate your lasers, double guns, multipliers or boost your speed. To get the better items such as multipliers or shields, you will have to collect numerous power-ups, but to get missiles or speed-ups, you will only need one or two power-ups. You get to decide if you'd rather spend your power-ups on missiles or lasers or save them in order to get a multiplier. These are invincible glowing orbs that surround your ship and mimic your movement and fire. They can fire whatever type of missiles or gun laser you have, essentially giving you 2 to 5 times the firepower you would have without them. And believe me, you'll need them, as the difficulty in Gradius 5 is incredibly unforgiving, and demands that the player takes their time instead of flying headfirst into battle and hoping for the best. With tons of bullets, lasers and ships flying around constantly and only needing to take one hit to die, you'll have to play through many, many times in order to beat the game. And because of this simple fact, the replayability is simply off the charts. So if you're like me and enjoy shooters, and have all but exhausted the other options on the PlayStation 2, then Gradius 5 is the gold standard. The Front Mission series is one of Square's longest running franchises, with many of its entries often being considered to be some of the best SRPGs on the market. The fifth game, Scars of the War, never made its way outside of Japan, but thanks to a full English translation, it's now easier than ever to jump into. The story covers time periods from both before and after the earliest and latest points of the series, tying up plot elements of about seven other games while telling its own story. The main issue though is that the story it tells just isn't that good. Even when and showing negative aspects of war, it takes on a more positive approach, which feels a far cry away from the dramatically political-driven stories of the past. But thankfully, the gameplay more than makes up for any shortcomings with the game's setup. Like many other SRPG offerings, all of the action takes place on a grid, with the player taking control of several units which are all fully customizable with new weapons and armor that help make each encounter far more manageable. It takes much from Front Mission 2 and implements it in its own way, with the job system being 
in the most volatile. Each pilot you get to use specializes in one of six jobs, assault, gunner, jammer, launcher, mechanic, and striker. However, pilots can freely train in other jobs without being severely handicapped through weapons and such. This allows for some degree of flexibility in how players can improve their pilots and easily becomes one of the best features in the game, especially towards the end, where you're almost encouraged to find new ways to deal with the ever-growing threat of the enemy. Now visually, Scars of the War is a real showcase for the PlayStation 2, from each painstakingly detailed mech to the vast and beautiful environments that are laid to waste by huge explosions and special effects. It's a game that looks just as impressive as it did when it first released. In short, Front Mission 5 is simply a masterpiece, and by far one of the greatest SRPGs of all time. So if you've never played it, it's one game that I highly recommend. The PlayStation 2 played host to some of the most iconic racing games in history, such as Gran Turismo 4 and Need for Speed to name a couple. But like most consoles, many of the lesser known games that never got their chance in the limelight simply fade into obscurity. And the best example of that would be Shocks, part of the EA Sports big franchise that brought us hits like SSX Tricky and NBA Street. Shocks is a rally racing game that brings along with it the franchise's focus on frantic sports action. What helped it stand out amongst the competition was its lack of traditional modes and instead a central focus on a championship that sees you take in one of the 24 officially licensed cars through 30 different races all spread across five separate leagues. I know it may sound simple, but it's during gameplay where Shocks really starts to shake things up. In the game, each track features three Shock Zones. These are sections of the course where you are timed and placed in the order of gold, silver or bronze in the real race. Since each race consists of three laps, you will have three chances to obtain a gold rating. And the objective objective is to complete all three segments within a given event. This is how you'll be earning money in the game that allows you to unlock more cars to race with and provides an incentive to take risks out on the track and constantly fight for the best time possible. Thankfully, the gameplay is tight and responsive, with each car offering up a different look and feel, allowing you to eventually settle into one that suits your style of driving perfectly. Even though Shocks has only a single mode of play, there are plenty of extras and unlockables to keep coming back, and with its slick presentation, unique racing mechanics and challenge, it never gets old. If you've played the other racing games on the PS2 to death, then Shocks might just be what you need. Skybanner is an air combat shooter that sees the player taking on the role of cute animals known as gunners, who serve as the protectors of a town called Rive and the special engine that resides there. This engine is said to be capable of perpetual motion, and it's not long until someone wants to take its power for their own evil ends. This is where the player comes in, to take on a range of different missions that see you ascending to the skies and tackling the several legions of enemies that are just as capable and cunning as you. From dogfights to ground runs and taking on flying battles battleships, there's plenty of variety to each run, with your standard machine guns along with an assortment of secondary fire that varies with characters such as pumpkin bombs, cross missiles and fireworks, and along with these abilities you've also got special maneuvers that are unique to each character as well, from ricocheting bullets to slowing down time and evasive techniques. Each has a role to play, and finding which character suits your approach is half the battle. Now one of the key points to the gameplay is the scoring system, in which you will have to learn how to effectively take take out your enemies without relying on your machine guns alone. Part of the strategy with the game is to take out groups of enemies that will increase your multiplier and keep your score above the negative mark. This portion of the game is what keeps you on top, as it seems to be a competition of sorts against the other characters in the world in which your score is dependent on what types of upgrades you get later on. If you're looking for a game that's easy to pick up and play but hard to master, then Skyganner is just a ticket. The best way to sum up Genji Dawn of the Samurai would be that it takes the best aspects from both Onimusha and Ninja Gaiden and produces something uniquely special. You get to choose from one of two characters throughout the adventure. The hero Yoshitsune is very fast and can unleash long combo strings against groups of enemies and somersault out of the way of incoming attacks, whereas the slower Benkei can take down several enemies in a single swing of his giant club. Utilizing both characters throughout the game is essential in order to overcome the masses of enemies that 
that are thrown your way. As you would expect, you've got many ways to counteract the threat they pose, with the bread and butter of gameplay revolving around the use of something known as Kamoi, a unique ability that's granted to the mystical stones each character carries. It allows you to slow down time so you can concentrate on finding the right moment to counterattack to take out most enemies and deal huge amounts of damage to bosses. By mastering this technique and using it to score huge combos, the amount of XP you gain also increases, which eventually allows you to level up and unlock several new attacks. These light RPG elements were a welcome addition and will give you an extra incentive to fully utilize every option you have in order to level up faster. Further expanding on this is the weapon and armor system that lends the game a nice sense of exploration as you search for specific ingredients to build more powerful and agile options when it comes to the build of your character. Weapons will actually grant, depending on which weapon it is, special attributes, such as siphoning health from the enemy for your own healing, or your physical strength increasing as you progressively attack an enemy. It's a great way to keep the combat fresh, and because of it, there's never a dull moment throughout the game's admittedly short runtime. On the whole, Genji is for sure not without its problems, but the smooth and flawless controls, nail-biting combat, and authentic Japanese atmosphere all add up to one of the best samurai games you can find on the PS2. If you've never got around to it when it first released, it is well worth going back and giving it a go for yourself. God Hand is a rather comical take on the beat-em-up genre that comes from the same mind that brought us the likes of Resident Evil and PNO3. The premise sees Satan and his minions setting out to annihilate humanity with only one thing standing in their way. Armed with the power of God yourself, you'll be kicking and punching your way through nigh on endless waves of enemies as you fight to free the world. What makes this game's attempt at the story so enjoyable is that it doesn't take itself serious in any way, with several humorous moments and some real laugh-out-loud lines each character you'll meet absolutely oozes personality that lends the game an extreme amount of charm. When it comes to gameplay, the core concept revolves around how you can customize your move list with over 100 different kicks, punches, and special moves that you either buy, receive from enemies, or find whilst exploring the world. The best thing about it is the insane sense of freedom this system offers, as you're free to build your main combo from these moves, as well as assign other attacks to specific buttons, allowing the player to create their own setups that suit their specific style of play. Apart from your basic attacks, you've also got a suite of special moves known as God Reels that upon pressing R1 throws you into a slowed down state where you're free to select from a range of these moves and execute them to devastating effect. Finally, you've got your God Hand that upon filling the gauge on your life bar, you're free to unleash, which gives you a short bout of invincibility as well as faster attacks and more damage. All of these systems add up to one of the most frantic and enjoyable beat-em-ups in recent memory, with many of the fights becoming stupidly chaotic but never to the point of frustration. For those of you watching looking for a challenge, God Hand has got you covered. If you find it out there on the cheap, don't hesitate to add it to your collection. Well that does it for another video, keep an eye out for part 3 as that will be coming up soon, so don't forget to subscribe and hit that bell to get notified about new videos that release every Monday and Thursday. You can follow me on all of the socials which are linked below to stay up to date and also join my growing community on Discord to meet many like-minded gamers to continue the conversation with. I'd like to give a special shout out to my Patreon supporters, Rhino, Skill Jim, Shuden, Richard, Amy, Daniel, Dio, Omar, Strider, Pierre, Carl, Awesome Jacket Dude, Maximus, Scott, Alfred, Terry, Ryan, Alex, GameCube Galaxy, Pierce Salaryman, Fake, and Paddy J for their continued support that helps make these videos possible. If you're interested in joining my Discord or supporting the channel through Patreon, you'll find all of these links down below. As always, thanks for taking the time to check the video out. I'll catch you next time.